So what we try to do in this uh, special journal issue is that we ask the contributors uh, to address a set of questions. And I would like to uh, share with you the questions uh, now. If I, yes. um, so we had four, five main questions. Um, first, we ask um, to what degree is uh, 1325 actually being translated into programs and measures on the ground? And what outcomes does that have for women's lives and for peace and security? Two, we ask, what are the implications of the resolution's focus on armed conflict as opposed to other forms of structural violence for peace and security? Uh, thirdly, we ask, how do women activists in conflict areas actually use 1325? How do they reconcile, if at all they manage, the univers universality of the resolution with the particularity of different conflict situations in which they are living? Um, and four, we ask, is the privileging of a universal gender identity in understanding, understanding women's experiences and responses to conflict a useful tool or maybe an obstacle to women's activism? What about other social categories such as nationality, class, ethnicity or religion? And finally, we wanted to find out and we asked contributors to reflect on the question what does the formulation, adoption, or implementation of 1325 tell us about the nature of post-Cold War global governance? So these are the main five questions, and I, um, I will leave them on during the presentation so that we, that we um, have a good frame to, to reflect on. So the different contributors to our volume have all provided uh, different answers to these questions. And indeed, uh, there's little consensus over whether 1325 and the Women, Peace and Security Agenda represents a radical shift towards a more inclusive, gender-sensitive global government, whether it strengthens or maybe even undermines women's grassroots struggles for justice and security, or whether it might be mere rhetoric that changes little in practice. So uh, in this presentation, Nicola, I want to highlight uh, three main issues which emerge from the articles in this uh, special <coughs> journal issue. These uh, three issues concern both the conceptual basis as well as the policy and pra practical implications <coughs> of 1325. So the three issues that we would like to address is firstly the link between gender and conflict in 1325. How is gender and conflict linked in 1325? Then secondly we would like to address the link between structure and agency in 1325. And finally, the link between 1325 and different feminisms. What kind of feminisms are reflected in 1325 or not? So let me try and uh, address the first, uh, the first issue, the link between gender and conflict in 1325. So, I mean, as we all know, the resolution is uh, very unique in its linking of gender and processes of conflict, conflict prevention and conflict resolution. In other words, it's unique in its linking of social dynamics and political dynamics, of establishing this link between the social and the political. Of course, the view that politics is not merely confined to the public sphere, but also includes uh, the private sphere and issues of social issues and gender relations has been a very key insight of feminism. But the ways in which this link between the social and political is conceptualized, we would argue, is very crucial. And more importantly, we need to demand not only that gender is actually included in conflict analysis and peace building, but very importantly, we need to ask how is gender included and what kind of political implications does that have. So let me try to give an, an example of what I mean by this linking of uh, the social and the political and how and asking how gender is included in conflict analysis. There are some scholars who have argued that countries that are characterized by gender inequality are more likely to be involved in war or more likely to descend into conflict. So this view of linking, of establishing gender inequality as a cause for war and conflict has also been incorporated into arguments supporting the implementation of 1325. So, actually, if you look at the articles in our volume, there are some who suggest that such arguments 
might very easily slide into justifications for foreign intervention, including for foreign militar, military intervention, which then would claim to liberate women from so-called traditional or backward gender norms, and that this liberation is, is kind of a necessary step for maintaining international peace and security. Such arguments are quite dangerous because um, they reproduce a dangerous dichotomy between the liberated women in the West and the oppressed women in the global South who need saving, and therefore such arguments clearly echo colonial discourses. Such approaches, such linking of gender and conflict, do not reflect the more complex interrelationships that exist between war and gender, and they also risk provoking a local backlash against women's activism in the global South. So uh, I'm stressing this not to downplay the crucial role that, of course, gender identity related factors play in conflict, but rather I want to stress that uh, we must look very carefully at the ways in which gender identities are socially constructed and politicized before, during and after conflict. And we need to, to look at the roles that these gender identity constructions play in comparison with and inter in, in intersection with other more structural and more material causes of war. Uh, 